This happened to me about a week ago. I live out in a big area that's primarily used for agriculture, so there is seldom houses and lots of long empty roads around here. Because of this, my nearest neighbors are about a quarter mile in both directions. Beyond that is sparsely spread out neighbors on both sides of the road, with large fields full of varying grains and plants. Between properties and areas of housing, there are large amounts of land for cattle. Think flat plains with a few trees here and there sprinkled in. Because of this, there's not a whole lot of traffic going on on either way of the road. Most of the time, the entire road is dead. It makes it enjoyable for living out here. So, I have a five-month-old son that is in this new sleep phase of his where he needs to be put in the car at night and driven to sleep. Usually, at night, I will put him in his car seat and put him in the car, get in and go for about a 20-minute drive, turning around at a certain point and driving him back. This always seems to help him lull him into sleep and works every time I do it. All right, so now that we've got some background info cleared, here's what happened. About a week ago, it was around 10 p.m. at night. It was clear out, decent weather, not too cold, not too hot. I come out, put my son in the car and hop in, pull out of the driveway, and we're on the road driving. If you keep driving down a road, it just continues on straight with a sharp 90 degree turn that heads south. This road continues only for a few houses on either side, but mostly vast empty farm fields and grasslands that haven't been used. It's pretty barren. On both sides of the road, there is the typical road ditch that you would have and then there's a small fence. In these ditches and along these fences are very tall grass. I don't know if wheat grass is the correct term for it, maybe just wild grass. It's the tall grass that you see out in the country that reminds me of how wheat looks. It gets very tall along here because it's never cut. This is important and I'll explain why here in a minute. I need to mention that because we live where we do. Animal and nightlife is very common Deer are nocturnal by nature, so we see does by the dozen out here all the time. Blacktail, actually. Skunks are commonly seen just as much as raccoons and possums. You'll even see the occasional coyote sometimes, but that's more rare. We have cougars and mountain lions out here since they come down into the valley, but I have not personally seen one yet. Deer will sometimes pop out in front of your car at night. Same with other smaller critters. This is just something anybody that lives out here will know about and understand as common sense. I know there's wild animals at night. I just don't know what it is that I saw. I know it was not a deer, plain and simple. Okay, so I'm driving down this road and the road begins to incline slightly. As I'm going up this long, drawn out, slow incline, I notice the tall grass rustling on my passenger side or right side of the road and it's caught in my brights. I immediately get ready to brake because I'm thinking it's a deer about to jump out across the road or maybe a skunk or something and up stands this dark shape, hyena looking animal that seemed to stand up on two legs. It was tall, taller than a man. It scared the crap out of me. It all happened so fast within just a few seconds, but I got a look at it. It reflected a dark crimson kind of eye shine because my brights hit its eyes. It stood up out of the tall grass, facing my direction. I don't know if it looked directly at my vehicle, but I saw its face. It was very twisted and hyena looking. I wish I could describe it better for you, but I can't. It gave off a really bad vibe that I felt the second I saw it, and it lingered. It was this horrible feeling I felt in the pit of my stomach that just screamed I shouldn't have seen what I did. When I first saw the grass rustling, I had let my foot off the gas, but not pressing the brake. As soon as I saw this, I had about three seconds of shock and, what is that? And then slammed the gas to go. The whole time, trying to rationalize what it is that I saw and what it could have been. Even though I got to see it from the front, I couldn't see any specific details like what its arms or hands looked like because they were down on its side but it resembled a very hairy person 
with an ugly hyena looking head and face. That's what I made out from the few seconds of my brights hitting it through the grass. And then, that evil feeling. Gosh, it's hard for me to type this out without getting chills just thinking about it. I have never just felt that overwhelming sense of evil before. Once you feel it, if you ever have felt it, you'll know. It's uncomfortable. The spot I usually stop to turn around at, I sat there for a minute and hesitated on what to do because I had to turn around to go back home. The exact same road. I didn't want to cross that spot again and see that thing. After sitting there for maybe five minutes, debating with myself, I talked myself into doing it. I was very nervous the entire drive back home, even though it's only a 10 minute drive back. As I drove back through that spot, I didn't see the animal again. I even looked in the same spot I saw it before. It was gone. The feeling too was gone, and it didn't seem to be anywhere around that I could visibly see. Anybody out there who's listening will understand where I'm coming from if they've ever had a sighting that's truly frightened them as this did to me. Whether it be something that doesn't exist or a true animal, fear is fear. There's just something far more to this than seeing something that I didn't know what it was. It invoked this awful feeling of fear and dread. I've never had that happen before. I don't think it was a natural animal either. Nothing besides bear will stand up on their hind legs like this did, and it was skinny looking. The face is what still haunts me when I rethink about this encounter. I don't want to dwell on this too much, but thought if I told you about my sighting with whatever this animal is, I could possibly get some answers. What did I see that night? I was invited out to a friend's house a few years back, south of Phoenix. He lives kind of out in the middle of nowhere, but one of the main directions he gave me at the time was that there was a large cattle farm near where he was. He said that this cattle rancher had a bad habit of not being careful enough and, more often than not, would have cattle wander off and die. In fact, it wasn't uncommon to see dead cattle off in the distance. Well, he wasn't wrong. On my way to his house, I probably saw at least three dead cows on my way there. This is the same time that I also saw the largest bird in my entire life. Out not too terribly far away from the road was this monstrous sized white bird eating away at this dead cow that must have wandered off too far and died. The bird was easily the size of the cattle and it was certainly a sight to behold. I couldn't stop staring, even while trying to maintain eyes on the road. The entire time I was trying to grasp what kind of bird gets that big. It wasn't at all trying to conceal itself in any way, just feasting away at this dead cow. There were other cars on the road as well, so I'm sure I was not the only one to see it. It was in plain sight, you just had to look off in that direction. It was pulling massive chunks of meat off its bones. It never flew away, just kept feasting of the meat on this cow. I got to my friend's place eventually and told him, you have giant birds around here that are eating off the dead cows. And I remember he just kind of gave me a blank stare. I don't think he ever knew how to respond. He asked me what I was talking about and I explained what I saw. I don't think he really believed me. Here I just thought I saw a bird that might be a normal thing around the area, but I guess not. I wouldn't be surprised if all the dead cattle lying around brought in scavenger animals of all kinds. Maybe that was the situation. I don't know. I'm not familiar with any of the species of birds that live out here in the desert, but it was an animal sighting I won't forget. I work on oil rigs. I have since I was 20, and I'm 33 now. In 2007, I was working for Nomac Drilling, and they have since sold out to Patterson, and we were drilling in the Haynesville for natural gas. Anyone who works on rigs knows that work can take you way off the beaten path from what normal civilization is used to. Some places, you're on ranch roads for an hour before you reach the location, and others you're driving on roads canopied by trees in the backwoods of Louisiana. This happened to me in the latter. We were rigging right down after fishing a well, and we were on our last night of the seven-day hitch. About halfway through our 12-hour tour, per 
pronounced tower, and we had pretty much finished in making sure everything was tied down securely for the rig move. We killed the light plants, and the driller let us knock off early. This area was accessible outside Houghton, and the lease was actually on the back of the Barksdale Air Force Base, but we had to leave the way we came in. Driving home at 2 in the morning seemed pretty normal. At first, and I made it to the blacktop with no issues. The blacktop was still canopied by trees, and other than the lights from my truck, everything was pitch black. Out of nowhere, still basically in the middle of nowhere, this thing appears almost close enough to get hit on my driver's side. Okay, weird, but even more strange. He was leaning at what I swear was an impossible angle for somebody not to tip over. They were stretched, reaching out towards my truck, and what I could see, the face was morbid and twisted. The hairs on the back of my neck raised, and I gassed it to speed back closer to society. It was about a two-hour drive home, and I felt off the rest of the trip. More oddly, I was working over on a separate occasion with one of the crews that work when I'm home, and another hand was talking about a very similar, if not identical, experience. I don't know who or what I saw, and the face could have been a blur from a relative distance, speed, and the time I actually saw it, whatever it was. But what could it have possibly been? Years ago, I was working as a chemicals operator at a company near the airport here around Huntsville, Alabama. I was scheduled to work a third shift, and I had extra time on my hands before going into work that night. So just before dusk, I went down to a swamp I knew had some good bass and bluegills to try out some new fishing lures I had just bought. Now, mind you, this is in the afternoon hours, and some people were still driving up and down this road, getting home from work, so traffic was pretty frequent. As I stood along the edge of the road in the swamp, casting my lure out, I hear a very large tree snap and crash in the backside of the swamp. I have never heard a tree fall in the woods naturally before, other than someone with a chainsaw cutting it. Then, two minutes later, another tree snapped and crashed close to the same area. Totally not a coincidence, so I'm no longer fishing at this point. Instead, I started walking down the edge of the swamp on the road to get a better look into the woods. I couldn't see anything moving or standing, at least as far as I could see anyway. Since the sun was going down behind the swamp, it was very dark in those woods. I started to hear something running towards me. I wasn't scared because I could tell it had to be small, running my way. Then, out of the thicket of the woods came a red fox running straight at me and passed by me by about two feet, crossing the road, not even looking for cars or anything. It was completely scared out of its mind, like something was hunting it. I turned back towards the swamp that this fox had ran from, and I could smell it. The smell of a wet, dead goat that had been rotting in the hot summer sun for about a week. It was god-awful, too. I got that eerie feeling that I should leave. So that's exactly what I did. To this day, I've never gone into those woods to investigate what made me feel that way. I know that foxes don't normally run toward people, but that fox was scared of something in those woods and it didn't give a damn about me or heavy traffic. No, I didn't see a Bigfoot or a Dogman, but then again, I have never seen a Black Panther either, and I know they are real. Two trees falling, fox running by my legs, that horrible smell and that eerie feeling. Too much to be a coincidence for me. I used to live in Eastern Washington State, where I raised goats for a living. I'm apprehensive to tell you what I'm going to tell you, because you might think I'm crazy. In fact, I know many will think I'm crazy, but there is truth to my story. I'm even debating finishing this and sending it, but it's probably for the best. One time in the evening, I saw some sort of unidentified thing grab my goat out of the sky and carry off with it. Now, I know it sounds ridiculous, but not even I could rationalize what I had seen. This huge, hairy, bat-like winged creature descended down from the trees nearby and grabbed my goat 
with these large like ape hands and what looked to be huge hairy arms and flew off over into the other area of trees. I didn't have my rifle on me, so in trying to shoot it out of the sky wasn't an option in the moment. It happened so fast I didn't even have time to process what it was I was witnessing. Our back area is surrounded by older woods and whatever this creature was came from that general area. I had grabbed my rifle after it took my goat and pursued it a couple of miles into the back wooded area, but never found a thing. No trace or sign that there was anything out of place. I don't know what it was and I don't know what took my goat. I know bats don't get that big, but this thing had long legs and arms like it might walk upright, or best I can describe as kind of monkey or apish. I only saw it briefly, but I know damn well that nothing is supposed to look like that with large bat wings. Is it possible that Washington State is home to large carnivorous bats that inhabit the forests? I've asked around in my circle of friends of large bats in the state, and nobody I know knows what on earth I'm talking about. I haven't had any issues with anything in the like since this has occurred. I keep my goats much closer to my home now, and I don't let them wander off near as far for fear that more of these beings will come and take my goats. I just wish there were more people that had these types of experiences. I feel alone, being the only one I've ever heard of dealing with this kind of creature. This event took place over a year ago, but I hadn't really thought to post about it until now. I don't want to dox myself, but I live in Maryland, and I was with my now ex-girlfriend at her house. It was a rural area, surrounded by woods in all directions. It was night, and we were going to visit her grandparents' house, a short drive away. We got into her car, and while she was fiddling with her phone and the aux cord, I saw something in the brush, illuminated by the headlights. It was tall, pale gray, thin, with a gaunt face and stretched limbs. I don't think it stood the standard eight feet of a crawler, but my lack of depth perception makes it hard to accurately perceive distance and height. All it did was watch. Its seemingly hollow eyes fixated on me. It was gone before I could point it out to my girlfriend, and I didn't have the bravery or stupidity to investigate. I wish I had concrete evidence of what I saw, but all I have is my word and a terrifying memory. This is my very own up and close personal account with a Thunderbird. I live in Canada, in the province of Ontario. It took place mid-December of 2011, around 4 a.m., and it was shaping up to be a very green Christmas as there wasn't snow on the ground at the time. Me, my brother, and a close friend went to smoke a joint out on my balcony as I live on a mid-upper floor of an apartment building. As we spark the joint, I see this dark black silhouette moving on top of the willow tree which is on the building property. FYI, my balcony has the best view of it as I see this silhouette fluttering on the top crown canopy of the willow. I grab my brother and friend's attention, asking them if they can make out what the hell I'm seeing which was a big WTF moment, thought it was a big black tarp being animated by wind flow. Once all three of us locked into what we were seeing, things like wings, a neck, and the structure of a bird became very apparent. This thing seemed very restless as it kept pacing around the top canopy of the willow. During this time, cell phones had really crappy night support cameras, as I'm sure many of you might remember. Trying to take videos at night with an iPhone 3GS, BlackBerry Bold LG, and early Android smartphones if zoomed in were left horrible, grainy rubbish. We tried to capture it on camera from my balcony, which yielded the above mentioned results. All three of us ran down to the ground floor. Man, the mere presence of this animal keeps your soul frozen. It's like you can't fathom something like this being thrown to you, visually. It was in that moment that led me to discover what our natural high is in this world. And trust me, whatever effects the weed had yielded long dissipated from when I thought I was looking at a black tarp caught onto the top of the tree. 
my bro and our friends made it about six feet away from the door that leads out from the building. These guys weren't really mentally prepared for something like this, as they both tripped over each other from keeping their eyes glued to it. This animal is quite frightening, especially when you have to come to terms with the reality you now share with it, knowing it's living and breathing as you are. I chose to proceed closer to the tree until I got about five feet from it. I couldn't approach any closer as it shrieked a sound so intimidating and loud. It sounded like an eagle on steroids, but much deeper and sharper in terms of its pitches. I distinctly remember it going into a crouched position with its tail up and its head charging downwards with its wings up halfway, opened and curled upwards. This bird is all black with some red feathering near the face. Never felt that specific feeling of fear before. I ran back towards my bro and friend and the bird continued to get more restless and aggressive. It literally flapped its wings, hopped up to the next building, which is about four stories high with the willow is about seven stories and the distance between both places are less than 15 feet. It paced around there, agitated, then flew off again and disappeared. The wingspan was definitely 16 plus feet easily, and it was about 10 feet tall. A lot of people share this type of experience with themselves. Well, I was lucky enough to share it with two others. We told a few of our other friends, and surprisingly, they believed us. I became really obsessed with finding answers. I even thought about calling the avian people who oversee the birds and wildlife, but didn't want them to think we were crazy or lying. Definitely found things that helped me understand more about the Thunderbird and my experience. One thing that stood out the most was that it was at nighttime. I feel like it's evolved and adapted to being nocturnal, and that's why it goes unnoticed during the day. Never seen another bird that active, let alone be in clear sight during the night, besides owls or even bats. I've been interested in crawlers for a long time even if I didn't necessarily know what to call them. I read a post a long time ago about how humans have a deep fear for creatures that resemble them and theorized we had an ancestral memory of long extinct predator. I've toyed with the idea on and off for a long time since then. I've been seeing something walking around my office in the bushes. At first it was transient, but now I'm not so sure. I got a pretty good look at it out the window the other day, and it looked all wrong for a human. I'm afraid about some of the people who work here late at night. Does anyone know any real information about these? And no, I'm not talking about the fictional creepypasta or the rake. I'm talking about a real creature. Six months ago, I decided to take a late evening hike on the Monte Sano Mountain in Huntsville, Alabama. It was a typical hike, about three miles on a looping trail that I am very familiar with. About halfway through, I had the most sudden jolt of absolute terror and doom, like someone close to me had died, and or that I was fixing to die, followed by immediate, the most tired I have ever been, pure exhaustion. It was getting dark, and I did everything in my power to stop moving but the exhaustion was just too much that I dipped off the trail and a bit found out my bag down against a tree, leaned against it and dozed off. It was one of those I can hear everything around me kind of sleeps, where you aren't really sure if you're asleep or not asleep. I began to hear what sounded like people walking quickly towards me, breaking branches and rustling leaves. I open my eyes and the sound immediately stops and I'm overwhelmed by the feeling that whatever was walking was now not moving because it was watching me. I stay frozen aside from removing my EDC. For the next 10 minutes, I sit dead still, looking towards the direction the sound was initially coming from. As it continues getting darker, I make the decision to stand and move towards the trail so I don't get lost in that exact moment, and I stand up. Here, the movement again, except this time, it seems to be going the opposite direction and much quicker I run towards the sound to try and just get a glimpse from the top of a ravine. I then see what appears to be a massive white dog 
running on all fours, about 75 yards away from me. I whistle the loudest I can, and it immediately freezes, stands up on its back two legs, and begins walking around and looking in my general direction. I was absolutely terrified and took off running. As I'm running, I could hear whatever this was running alongside me, still 75 yards or so away, until it hits a massive drop off, which is an area called Three Caves. I'm on the trail going down towards my vehicle, and I hear the craziest, almost human-like scream growl that I've ever heard, echoing from the top of the drop off where the caves is located at. I immediately get in my vehicle and take off. I have no clue what this was, I'm not the type to BS a story or see things that aren't there or any of this, so it's all weird to me. I have begun re-hiking and watching these areas as well as looking for signs of the monster and will update you as my progress is made. I should clarify when I say hunting, I don't mean I plan to kill whatever this is, but I would like to get a picture of it or more evidence. Could someone maybe explain what happened to me and my friend and what we saw two years ago? So me and my friend TJ, back in 2018, used to do a lot of cryptid and ghost hunting, especially because we're from RI. There's a lot of stories of areas with crazy history. An example is the woods, a block from my house that has some stone steps in the middle of it, completely out of the way from everything. Basically, long story short, the stairs were from a church that burnt down long ago, and rumor has it, people died in that fire, and that's why the woods are haunted now. Me and my friend B saw some thing in the woods too, which is a different story, but with this image in your head, now you can understand why this has a lot of paranormal activity. Now, back to the main part of the story. Me and TJ one night found out the conjuring house is like a 20 minute drive from us, so we decided to check it out. It was about 2 a.m. when we started driving there, and a lot of weird stuff started to happen when we got to the first road to the way to the house. For reference to how creepy this area was, it was practically out in the middle of the sticks. Barely any street lights, and lastly, the energy was the strangest. It felt like we were being watched all the way to the house. When the GPS said about three minutes away from the house, TJ's radio started glitching, repeating the chorus of R.I.P. by Joji. Needless to say that the vibe got a lot darker after that, and we actually arrived. When we got there, not much happened until we were about to leave. The vibe was growing worse the longer we stayed, and then TJ heard something, so we left because the energy was something different. As we're leaving, the GPS quickly made us turn to a road different from the way we came. As soon as we were approaching the original entrance to the street of the Conjuring House. At the time, we didn't think much of it because we were just trying to leave the area because the way it was just making us feel. This road was a lot creepier than the others because of how it brought us directly in the middle of the woods. Even some parts weren't paved, if remembering correctly, with really weird looking houses spaced apart. Well, as we were going down the road, I looked down my phone, and in that second, TJ starts punching my arm, yelling, look up, look up. And as I looked up, the strangest thing I've ever seen in my life jumps across the road, like five feet away from the car, and into the woods at the speed of a cheetah. To give you guys a better idea of what it looked like, first it was as tall as a kangaroo, and I mean the tall ones. The thing had to be at least 7 feet. Second, it was jumping in medium sized jumps. Not sure what the word for movement is, but quick. How a gear works. That's how smooth and fast the thing's legs touched the ground, propelled forward and repeated. Like in the 4 seconds it took to drive the car to where it was on the road. It was like 100 feet away into the woods. Lastly, the most amazing but strange thing about it was its actual appearance. It looked like moving energy, a bunch of lines moving together in the shape of this animal, looking thing, and its colors were crazy. It was a combination of neon brown, dark green, 
orange and some other less noticeable colors that sort of filled in the rest of its shape it was taking. As we drove by, we freaked out over the course and talked about it the whole ride home, just trying to make sense of what we saw. We even tried to find the road we were on that night on three separate occasions after that to see if we could maybe see it again, but we never found that road again. That night changed my life because I've never thought I'd see something like that so close, but since then, I've been trying to find answers. My great-grandfather was a very passionate outdoors man. Well, he still is. Hunter, survivalist, woodsman expert, you know, the kind of guy who lives for the outside world of exploration and adventure. The kind of guy who regularly spends weeks out on hikes at a time and spends more time in solitude than others. He survived in multiple climates, terrains, and states for that matter, and even other countries. At the age of 103, he's still going for it, incredibly healthy, and a very alert mind. He tells me the secret to his longevity and health is being constantly active and putting in good food into your body. But anyway, he's told me about some things he's found on his adventures before, and nothing is ever too out there. In the last six months, I learned of something called the Thunderbird, which is supposedly this large bird that is said to show up before and after a storm. And I was telling my great-grandfather about it and my interest in it, and he told me a couple of different stories. The first was back in the 60s when he was doing a 40-mile hike through the outback of Southern California. Listen, I know it's technically not called the outback, but that's what I like to call it. It's harsh, barren wilderness, so it makes sense. This man will do these kinds of hikes to one, stay in shape, and two, push his body to its limits to prove he can do it. At one point during his trek, he was attacked by a bird of angelic size that nearly grabbed my great-grandfather in its talons and carried him away. He said that even this bird dwarfed that condor or other large birds. He was able to burn it with a torch he had at the time and scared it off. It was clear that its intent was to kill him. Said the bird was large, built like an eagle, but had very distinctive features to its face. I thought this detail was interesting, that its claws and beak were black, and it looked to have intelligence in its eyes, more than other birds. He even claimed that it came down from the higher Rocky Mountains, probably for hunting a meal, for its young. The second experience he had was when he had reached the end of a three-week hiking expedition in southern Nevada and found what he described as a feather the size of his torso. It was the largest feather he had ever encountered in his life, said it measured about four feet in length and about ten inches in width. He kept the feather with him for years until he lost everything he owned in a house fire years ago that nearly claimed his life back in the early 80s. I fully believe him. He's not the type to make up stuff like this and is a very honest and hardworking man who comes from the time area where honesty is valued. I haven't asked him about Bigfoot or anything else he might have encountered on his journeys, but I might have to sit down one of these days and pick his brain to find out more if he's got any good stories. He's still out and about doing his thing in the wild, so I don't get as much of a chance to talk to him as I would like. I have some information on the bird situation. In 2001, my husband and I were driving outside of New Wilmington, Pennsylvania late one night. It was around 2 to 3 in the morning. We had received a call that someone may have spotted our lost beagle. It was October, and we had a quiet moment while we were driving down this dusky country road. The moon was out and did light things up, but it was still dusk-like. All of a sudden, we heard a bird fly above us. It swooped down, soaring above our SUV. We thought it landed on our vehicle because we sort of lifted up a little off the road. Our windows were down and the bird came so close to our vehicle that we can hear it soar back up. It kind of lifted us up, or felt like it anyway. We both looked at each other and said, What was that? We looked up in the sky and a huge grayish white like bird with a wingspan of about 13 to 16 feet soared to a nearby white tree without leaves. It blended in so well, the bird disappeared when it landed on the limb. 
The tree looked petrified and dead-like. I said to my husband, that is the biggest bird I have ever seen in my life. I called it the bird man because its legs were so long and dangled like a man's legs. We came home and told our children, who are teenagers, the following morning, and they laughed at us. It almost looked prehistoric. I still find it hard to believe what we saw. When I came home from work this morning, my husband told me he heard about this big bird thing on coast to coast. I'm glad we here are not the only ones who have seen this amazing bird. I thought I would post about an encounter with a strange creature that I had. I'm a pretty big skeptic when it comes to stuff like this, and sometimes I doubt whether I actually saw it or not, but I remember it very clearly. In my hometown, there's a forest that's pretty big. Trails around the edges where people walk their dogs, but no one really goes inwards to the depths of it. Once a month or so, I get there bird watching. There's also a small river which, in drier months, is basically just a dip filled with mud and leaves. I walk along it on my way in, again on my way out. About two years ago, I was walking along the riverbank in May or June when, ahead of me, I saw what looked like a pale, hairless nude person digging around in the mud. I got a bit closer and realized the thing didn't appear to be human. It was quite tall its skin being a light medium gray, and it had no facial features that I could discern from at a distance, but with what looked to be a large, sunken, deep eyes. It was squatting and using its hands to rifle through the mud. Its arms were very long compared to a human, and it was very thin. I watched it for about 30 seconds or so when it looked in my direction, and I think it saw me. Because it paused and seemed to be staring at me for a few seconds, it then turned around, disappearing quickly, but casually, into the trees on all fours. I hadn't seen it before or since. I left just after because I was apprehensive and worried it might be something aggressive, but there wasn't anything in its demeanor that made me feel threatened. It was like watching an animal foraging and seemed calm the whole time. A lot of encounters I've read seem to be about creatures that have a menacing energy but this thing just seemed to want to go about its business uninterrupted. If anyone has any idea what I might have seen, I'd appreciate it if you could let me know. I took my cousins out for a night stroll out this last month. Some backstory. Usually every May, a lot of my family will go out to my wife's cousin's house, which has tons and tons of woods surrounding it. It's very peaceful Every May, a lot of us cousins will go, see each other, and have tons of food and hang out for a few days at a time. Think like a big Christmas get-together, but instead it's in May. This time, we decided at night to do some night hiking around these parts to explore and to see what we could see. My wife's cousin has great sets of high-powered flashlights. They're the rather expensive kind, but they work great. They have multiples of them, so, I decided to take a few of the little ones out with me. So it was me and my three little ones, aged 8 to 13. So, maybe not little ones, but they're still just kids. The entire time we're walking around, we aren't seeing a whole lot of anything. Mainly just deer from time to time, and that's about it. They were terrified that a cougar was going to get us, because cougars are nocturnal hunters. But I kept them calm letting them know that we were making too much noise to draw in a cougar and would scare it away. That's when they decided it would be the best idea to travel into even thicker woods where the underfooting wasn't as safe due to unseen rocks and brush. At the time, I wasn't aware of that, so I said of course, being in the moment and not wanting to disappoint them. I feel like bravery got the best of all of us as we traveled into the thicker and thicker dense parts of the forest. It was quiet, but I had noticed that there had been no crickets out at all this night. Having really nice flashlights, we were pursuing to push as far as we could. The part of the forest that we were descending down was a hill that eventually drops off to a steep canyon, which drops off again into a small river that flows around the area. 
During the daytime, the scenery and the sights are beauties in their own right, but during the night, it could be a death trap. As we're descending down to that point into the thickness of the forest, we hear branches breaking and the sounds of something big moving around just a little past us in the trees and brush. The time of year was not in our favor. Being springtime, everything has grown back, full and lush. You don't have a ton of visibility because of that. The kids and I halted, listening quietly. That's when the 13-year-old started panicking, thinking it was a mountain lion, but I kept trying to signal to him to be quiet and to listen. That's whenever it was stopped making noise. We stood there for a minute, thinking that whatever this supposed mountain lion was doing, that maybe it heard us and walked away. We didn't hear anything though, and had it left the area, we would have heard it trot off into the night. It was just quiet. I kept signaling to the others to slowly start to back away in case it was, and that's when we heard whatever it was start coming towards us in the trees. It sounded so much bigger than any mountain lion because each step it took was a heavy thud. That's when I started to grab the kids and swiftly retreat back up the hill we were coming down. We were all trying not to scream. It was an incredibly scary situation to be in, and I think even the more experienced and tough men of the mountain would have been terrified. I turned around to hopefully, or not hopefully, catch some sort of glimpse of whatever was moving in our direction towards us, and I see this big yellow glowing eyes higher up than I am. That's when I lost it and just bolted it with the kids out of there. When I saw those eyes, that was enough for me. I never shined my light at them. They were just glowing up there in the trees. Luckily, the kids never saw it because they were busy running up the hill, thinking it was some big mountain lion. I know for a fact that it was for sure not a mountain lion. It was big, tall, and sounded like the weight of a great weight. Why it started aggressively approaching us, I have yet to know. I don't think it bothered to chase us up the hill or anything. When we got out of that thicker part of the forest and the land had flattened out, there was nothing behind us and no signs of anything following behind us. I didn't care. I just got us all back to the house and that was that. They were freaked out, telling their parents that we went out there and almost got eaten by a huge mountain lion. I played along and agreed, but... I know it wasn't a mountain lion. It's probably for the best the kids never know it was either. I will never tell them that and risk scarring them for life, especially about those eyes. It was a scary experience and it's kept me out of that area at night. I'm going to give some context. I used to live in Slate Springs, Minnesota as a kid. I lived in the middle of nowhere with a giant meadow field about five miles long by seven miles wide. I looked at my old house just to make sure it's correct. Our closest neighbor owned some of it and stored giant cylindrical hay bales there. I clearly remember it being my birthday and it was very cold outside. I had just turned seven and was playing on my plastic little four-wheeler and I got a stick stuck in the wheel so I got off and picked it off. I remember getting up and looking up to see a giant bird fly over the giant field in front of my house and landed on a hay bale, and it was clearly almost three times the size of a hay bale. I remember freezing and then watching as it took off, almost crushing the bale. I then went running inside crying, but parents thought I was talking about a raven or something. Has anyone else seen something similar? About a month ago, I told my dad about it and he said he remembered the neighbor saying something about a bird. One night, when I was like seven or eight, I went onto the roof of my house with my dad and brother to lie down. After about 30 minutes of talking and looking at the stars, we heard a noise that sounded like flapping. Then we saw a huge bird. I mean, this thing was massive, with a wingspan of maybe 25 to 30 feet. It just flew overhead and into the distance. We never saw it again, though we were pretty spooked. We thought it might have been a condor since they have a pretty massive wingspan, but from doing some research, we found out there are no condors in Texas, 
and they don't get as big as the bird we saw, so we weren't really sure. We often tell this story to friends. Obviously, some don't believe or don't want to, and others are intrigued by the whole thing. And one of them even said that we saw sounds similar to the Thunderbird, which is a creature from Native American legend whose wings are responsible for causing thunder. I don't know about that, but the sounds of the bird's wings flapping still gives me chills to this day. Whether it really was a thunderbird or a condor or some species of a giant bird, I'm not sure. But I know what I saw, as cliche as this is to say, it's the truth. I don't know what it was, but I'm more curious than scared. Did I see a thunderbird? A new species of giant bird. It was heading west from what I remember that night, towards New Mexico, Arizona, Nevada. So maybe its home is in the valleys and cliffs and caves over there. Like I said, I don't know. If anyone has any information on this or has had a similar experience, I would appreciate it if you could share it. I don't know what to believe, honestly. There's the part that wants to believe in the stories of the Thunderbird, but the other logical side is trying to tell me otherwise. But there's always that what if. What do you think? To give some background, my family owns a trailer home which sits on a cliff overlooking Lake Katune in the south of the Canadian province of British Columbia. This trailer was used as a sort of summer getaway destination as my parents and I visit for about a week or more each summer. The trailer itself is quite old. It was turned into a home by the previous owners in the 70s. But despite its age, it's still a very enjoyable place to experience the warmest months. The trailer sits in the middle of a cedar pine forest with a small clearing on the side facing away from the water to park vehicles, as well as a driveway connecting to the road which is about 110 feet away. The nearest town is roughly a 15 minute drive and there are no neighbors. I sleep at the opposite end of the trailer which I call the cabin as there is an additional dining room and porch built onto the trailer. With their bed at the front end and mine at the very back end, there are two windows next to where I sleep, with one facing parallel to the lake and the other towards the previously mentioned parking area. Due to the positioning of our cabin in the mountain valley, around 9pm this summer, it gets very, very dark very quickly. Since we sometimes are outside after this time, there's a bright lamp mounted on the front end of the trailer which completely illuminates the porch area facing the lake and partially lights the parking area, creating an orange glow that can get spooky, especially when raining. I hope the backstory wasn't too long, but it might help you get a sense of the surroundings. Around 11pm one night, I was still awake, sitting in bed and reading. I keep the blinds of the window facing away from the lake open as to provide a little light for reading without having to turn on any inside lamps. The light momentarily gets dimmer, so I glance outside. What I saw was a large, almost glowing white creature which moving through the semi-lit area casting a shadow over my window. It had very long and spindly limbs and I could see some contours that looked like emaciated ribs on its side. It was hard to estimate a height because it was moving bent over and what I can only describe as a crawl. Just looking at it instilled so much fear that I couldn't look away, despite how much I wanted to. The creature moved at a fast walking pace from the front of the cabin and into the tree line. At the same time, I wanted to believe that there was some form of very, very sick, hairless bear as we frequently saw bears in the area. Looking back, the limbs were just too long to be a bear and far too skinny. Also, I would think a bear with mange would still have some hair or even discolored skin, but this creature did not. It appeared entirely to be a white color and the light from the lamp reflected off its side making it glow a little. I wish I could provide any form of evidence that what I saw really happened, but ultimately, it's you, the reader's choice whether to believe me or not. When I have a moment, 
I'll draw a diagram to detail its movement in relation from where I was looking. Thanks for listening. I'll never forget about the time that I went camping with my family in Northern California, where my brother saw something he will never forget. I know that Northern California is home to a lot of things, giant redwoods, dangerous animals, even the supposed Bigfoot, but I never in a million years would have thought this animal existed. Now, I didn't really think much of this whole phenomenon at the time because I was simply too young and not aware of it. Well, I didn't really spend a lot of time looking into it until my brother sat me down and really told me about it. See, my family loves to just get in a motorhome and we drive around to different states and find great spots to camp out, whether it be a campground or just off the beaten path. It doesn't really matter to us. We'll find a way to have a good time, no matter what. In this instance, we were driving around Northern California, and I could tell you that I remember we were near the Redwoods at the time. I can't quite remember if we had gone through them yet, or if we already did. In fact, I probably couldn't even tell you the exact spot because I was much younger, but I remember that it was that dry desert kind of woods. If you're having a hard time following along, just simply Google what the terrain is like in Northern Cali, and you'll get an idea. It's not thick woods like in the Pacific Northwest. It's more dried out. Anyway, we decided to make our camp spot off the road we were on. There was nobody else around, and we figured it would be the perfect place. As we're getting set up, my parents sent my brother to see if he can find a nearby stream to pitch some water because we were running low at the time. My brother was 17 then and was already a very experienced outdoors kind of kid. He carried a knife on him all the time and was very knowledgeable about his general surroundings. It's not like my parents just sent their kid off in the woods without knowing anything. They raised him well. I think my father even spotted a small stream just a few miles away on the way up and wanted to see if it wrapped around. About 20 minutes later, my brother comes back pale as a ghost and says that he's seen the largest bird to have ever exist on prehistoric levels. My parents give him a puzzled look, but I think they ultimately just wrote it off and probably said something along the lines of he probably just mistook a big bird or something. What he explained to me was that it was a giant raven-like bird, but larger than him. It always really stood out to me because my brother doesn't get scared easily especially being out in the wilderness so much. We've been out in the woods together since we were just little kids, and to him, that's just a part of nature. Even the times that he's come across mountain lions and even bear, he's hardly phased because he's just accepted that's just a part of being out in the wild. But this was something that really bothered him, and I distinctly remember him acting different the rest of the day. It was bothersome. The day did go on though, and we ended up getting busy with just camping and living. And so before you know it, we're on our way out of there, and life continues to go on. One thing that's interesting is that my family and I did hear what sounded like a very large hawk very close by. If you know the sound of a hawk, you'll probably understand what I mean. Except the sound of this hawk was so loud. You know how you can tell when you hear an animal sound the general size of it? It's just common sense to know that if it's a larger animal, it's going to have more bass and fullness in its roar, cry, howl, whatever the sound the animal makes. Well, there's a couple of times in that nearby area afterwards, we had heard what sounded like a hawk, but much deeper and sounded like it belonged to a bird much larger. Again, the best way I can describe it accurately is that it had much more bass and vibration to its cry. I guess if you want to call it a hawk cry, I thought it was cool at the time, but I don't really think I put two and two together. The years went on, and my brother and I got to talking again, and he brings up this event. But this time, he went into far greater detail, explaining that as he was traversing down to this ravine to look for the stream, he saw what he described as a mixture of a raven and a hawk, except much larger than him. He said this thing's legs and talons were easily as big as his forearms and hands said the head and beak was larger than his own head and that it was watching him perched up on a tall dead tree on the other side of the ravine. It really scared him because he said he's never got a feeling like he did in that moment. He said it's like the bird was sizing him up 
and decided whether or not to come after him. I possibly don't understand how you could just feel that from a bird, even if it was a rather large bird of prey, but this is just what he relayed to me. The entire time he was in view of this bird, it was closely watching him, almost as if it was calculating his next decision. It never moved from that branch though, and only moved its head to follow him and his movements. He just got a feeling that it wasn't right and that he shouldn't be there. His gut instinct told him to get out of there. I'm not sure why I did not put much thought into this happening when it did, because this was years and years ago, but for whatever reason, when he retold me this experience of his, it was so much more profound to me. Possibly because I'm older now, which would make sense. He told me that he learned that there's something called a Thunderbird, and that people will talk about seeing it all over the United States. When I asked him more about the Thunderbird is, he himself is not quite sure. Some people report seeing a giant white bird. Others talk about seeing a prehistoric pterodactyl-like flying animal. His belief stands firm that he saw something that he believes didn't want to be seen. He really stands by that feeling, especially considering he's never seen a bird of that size and has never heard of a bird that looks exactly like this one did. It had a large pointed beak that dipped down at the end, just like a hawk, and had distinct white markings along the bottom of its neck and chest, but looked to be a mixture of black and brown. If he was guessing size, he would have said around five to six feet in height. It never spread its wings, so he wasn't able to get an accurate wingspan length. There's plenty of small wild animals out there with the area we were in, and there was nobody else around. I think we pulled off an old road that's no longer used since we were accustomed to just finding random roads that were either deserted or abandoned for best camping spots. It's where you get the best seclusion. He's not scared about it now, but it definitely opened up the book for him that there might be things out there that are undiscovered and that we don't know about yet. Whether it was truly something that had bad intentions or maybe just an undiscovered bird. Either way, it sounded far more intelligent than just your standard bird. Maybe there is some truth to the whole Thunderbird phenomenon after all. Back in 1996, me and my then girlfriend at the time saw what we believed to be a Thunderbird. Being from nearby and traveling a lot through the surrounding states, you tend to pick up on some information and learn a few things here and there especially from befriending locals and tribesmen alike. The desert is a dangerous place, and much of it is unknown to man. Even many of the natives wouldn't venture to some parts, and that is saying a lot. Let me get back to the story. So, back in 1996, we're driving along Highway 85 when my girlfriend taps me on the shoulder and points off to her side of the car, which is the passenger side. She's asking me, Do you see that out there? I briefly glanced over, and out of the distance you could see this large bird flying low to the ground. Far enough away that you couldn't make out specific details, but close enough you could tell that it was a bird, and very large in size. My first thought was that it was a condor, or some sort of large bird of prey, but as it ascended back into the sky and flew off in the distance, it was clear this was not the case. This thing had black feathers and resembled more of a large raven kind of bird than anything else. It did look different than a raven though. I want to establish that. As it ascended, you can kind of make out a little bit more of its body. And I remember clear as day, white markings on its tail area. The whole sighting maybe lasted 10 seconds at most, but it left my girlfriend and I in awe and wonder that such birds of size live out here in the desert. I could have never imagined birds that big to exist. It's really hard to put a size on it, but I could tell it was larger than the car I was in at the time, which was my 1993 Nissan Sentra. It was a very, very large sized bird. That's for sure. All right, I got two stories for you. First, about 17 years ago, break in a nasty storm about 9 p.m. in mid-October. My dad and I went out to survey the damage, see if anything had been taken care of before morning. Moon was just about full, above two thin layers of cloud, moving in different directions, looked cool. My dad noticed it first, told me to look up 
saw something dark flying above the first layer of clouds, which, even if they were low, would still have been ridiculously high. It passed in front of the moon. Sounds cheesy, I know. And the silhouette was that of a bird. Looked like some sort of raptor. The tips of its wings extended beyond the width of the moon. It must have been massive. Second, I don't know if it was a thunderbird, but whatever. I seen was a few years ago, and it was about 3 a.m. on a winter night. I couldn't sleep, so I went out for a cigarette and was casually looking around, and it was dead quiet. Not too surprising, because usually around that time, it's always dead quiet, because I live in a small northern town. But as I was puffing on my smoke, something caught my eye. The town lights were reflecting on the clouds that I see a huge bird, but this looked like a grayish color. The thing's wingspan must have been more than twice the size of my arm. With a long body, we have owls here, but they are small and turn white in winter. Whatever it was scared the crap out of me, and I rushed inside, making sure to quietly close my door. Then, just stared out of the front window for the next hour, staring into the sky. Alright, just a preface. I'm on mobile, so I'm sorry for formatting, but I live in southern Indiana, right on the border to Kentucky. I live in a small town, right smack in the middle, but we still have lots of wooded areas, parks, etc. My roommate works at McDonald's, and he sent me a message, clearly shook. He's telling me he saw a skinwalker. I'm not into that at all, so he explains what that is. He tells me he saw the big white mass, probably the size of a dog, so I assume coyotes, of course, go around some plants outside. He goes to check, and to his surprise, a black dog. Not a single light spot on its body. He said the dog didn't even acknowledge him as it walked away. Well, fast forward a few days to today, I'm coming home from work, about midnight and I see this big white blur across the road outside my apartment. My thought is, oh hey, a dog. So I park and I go across the road to the bushes that I saw it run into, and I find a black cat that looks off as soon as I come over. No sign of it being a big white dog. I wanted to send this out to you because I feel that you are now becoming one of the few narrators on YouTube that would actually appreciate what I have to say, and that might be so. I used to work for the fishing game Wildlife, and have for years and years, and even had experience training newbies. Many of my friends and colleagues are in varying levels of the fishing game. Oh, and I have a buttload of stories I can tell you about strange things that have happened, missing persons, and even bizarre encounters I can't quite conjure an explanation for. For starters, I won't unveil my real name, so you can just call me Dale. I've worked in Washington State, Oregon, California, and Idaho, just to name a few. I've also explored four years prior, and am a part-time survivalist, or I would like to think I am. Wilderness is just a part of what I do and who I am, so it made sense to me years back when I decided to become a part of the fishing game. But, as time went on, I realized there was a lot more gruesome and grim details to the job that I was not aware of prior. When you do what I do, you have to deal with a lot of things you might not necessarily be comfortable with. A perfect example is when we found a man about six years ago. Well, it was more like half of him from the waist up. He was hanging on a branch about 60 feet up in the air with part of his flesh embedded into a tall timber branch, miraculously holding him up from falling to the ground. He was no more than 48 hours freshly deceased. When I say cut at the waist, I mean it. It looked as if he had been surgically sliced down all the way to a point, showed no signs of a struggle, and we have no idea how he ended up in a tree 60 feet off the ground, about nine miles out from the main road. Even after we had determined his length of death, he showed no signs of virtually any decay, which in and of itself is somehow not possible. 
Or you might run into situations where you find children who have been missing, dead, and you have to tell the parents. That's never an easy job, especially when the little boy was right beside his mother on their hike when he seemed to vanish. It wasn't until almost two weeks later we found him having died due to exposure. 17 miles away on an 80-foot rocky incline, perfectly clean, healthy, and food even in his stomach. These, unfortunately, happen far more often than not, and we're kind of told to not really talk about it. This is why I was apprehensive to share what I have to say with certain people and narrators. If you do decide to read this, I want those that hear this and what I have to say to be taken seriously and to know that every time you enter the woods, whether it be camping, fishing, or just enjoying a hike, you are putting yourself at risk. I've encountered things like noises in the woods that I could not explain. One time when I was mentoring a few new students, one had gotten lost, trailing away from the group out of who knows what, and I had to go help and find him. Shortly before I found him, I heard his voice calling my name in the opposite direction that he was found. What's bizarre to me is he never knew my name before that because there were several of us who were mentoring this large group of new students. There had been no introductions and we hadn't met prior. The voice was also slightly different, like it would go in and out of pitch as if something was distorting it and trying to mimic his actual voice. And it wasn't just me. I've had several friends that have talked about a very similar situation when looking for missing persons or just doing their duty. Of course, there is always speculation on what it could be, but we don't really have anything concrete. Nobody that I'm aware of has talked about seeing anything or any physical source that would be responsible for this secondary noise or voice. And it's always the same thing. When they find somebody, the noise is always in a different direction, trying to lure said ranger in the opposite direction, away from the found person. Not I, but a friend of mine who's a little older and getting closer to retirement has had several run-ins with Bigfoot and invading certain areas of their territory. He has gotten rocks pelted at him and even a log thrown in his direction, nearly killing him had he just been a few feet over. I, myself, have found a few footprints that are clearly larger than any man could create, with an indent several inches deep. But, without the proper casting equipment, there's nothing I can do, nor record. It didn't take me too long on this job to learn and accept there are just several things in this world we can't explain, and that it is our job to conceal them from the public eye, at least the majority of things. These are just some of the many experiences that I've come to gone through in the past few years, and not even some of my colleagues can avoid. There's certain things that we avoid telling trainees about, and just letting them experience on their own. Some things you just can't really prepare a person for until they go through it themselves. My previously mentioned mishappenings that I've stated above should hold as any solid examples. I'll share with you some more stories of myself and my colleagues. I have plenty to share, so I hope you find enjoyment out of them. I can't quite remember where on the west coast it is, but I believe it's actually up in Washington state, where there had been reports of shoes with feet in them washing up on shore. I have found body parts before out in the wilderness where, where there is no reason for there to be a body part of a person. About five weeks prior to my discovery of my first body parts, which was a hand, by the way, an older gentleman in his later 50s was reported missing. Five weeks later, I was the lucky one to find his hand lying on the ground next to a thorn bush in tall grass. I didn't realize it was his hand at the time. What I saw was just a severed human hand, cut at the wrist with perfect precision, and again, no blood, a common reoccurring theme in a lot of these body parts you find. I thought it to be a Hollywood prop at first until I realized it actually belonged to somebody. Come to find out, it was actually the hand of the older gentleman that went missing. Again, 
another circumstance with zero decay or any sort of deconstruction of the flesh. When I said it looked like a Hollywood prop, I meant that. That would indicate that it was freshly severed, but could not have meant that he was actually alive for the time being. I'll never know, and they never did find his body, and he was one of the many cases ruled of an unknown outcome. His severed hand even still had his wedding ring on, which didn't have a drop of dirt on it. Perfectly clean, been gone for five weeks, and there was not any dirt or any mishappenings to this hand, or it looked like he had been outside. Somehow, this severed hand managed to be free of all imperfections like blood, weathering, age, dirt, etc. It's unfortunate, but it's not uncommon to find body parts of missing persons and to never find out who it belonged to, let alone the rest of the body. Another time I was on my way to a section of trail that I was busy closing off for the season, where I felt closely followed in the woods, but what I saw to be a blur of light. If you've ever seen the movie The Predator, the first one, it's in the jungles. It does this camouflage where it's transparent, but it has a blurred outline, making it somewhat visible when moving. That's pretty close to what I saw, but there were several of these surrounding me and following me down this trail off in the wilderness besides me. Going silent when I would stop and listen and taking tiny steps moving swiftly like a cat about to pounce on a mouse when I would pick up my pace. I've been out at night on rescue missions, training missions and the likes, and have seen yellow, green and red eyes staring back at me from the darkness with heights taller than myself. I have felt the woods go quiet and the feeling of death eminent around me. I don't want you to perceive the illusion that things don't happen to us on the job because even though we experience a variety of things for those that are unprepared and overly brave, there are always still going to be consequences. In the time that I've done this, I've known two people now that are now gone. The first was a younger gentleman in his later 20s who had been on the job for about four to five years. He had gone on several expeditions together with me and that I worked with him during training newbies. One day, he had wandered off the trail where he was assigned to go, and I never found a trace of them again, which was disturbing, to say the least. A couple of weeks go by, and we find his hat and a torn piece of shirt about three miles away. There's a reason this stuff doesn't reach the public news, because if people knew about anything that went on out here, there would be so much revenue loss that industries would tank, at least this one, minus extreme amounts of panic, one interesting account comes to mind, and it's a colleague which I am very close to. He claimed to have been out surveying an entire area where he witnessed what he thought was a mountain lion at the time stand up on its hind legs and attack a deer as it leapt off a rock. It acted just like a human would and even moved its body in the same way. It even appeared to be larger than an average mountain lion, but physically it resembled one down to a T, other than its abnormally large size. The same colleague of mine has mentioned on multiple occasions about seeing strange colored lights in the forest deep at night. There's been times he's been stationed in certain areas and can see blue, green, and purple lights miles off in the distance where there's virtually nobody around. I'm talking beyond trails and places where people ever camp. There is no explanation for glowing fading lights down in the trees that are about 5 plus miles away. They only last between 5 to 10 seconds at a time, but says he sees them every now and then. Off the top of my head, I can recall a very bone chilling experience that me and a close colleague had. Not the same colleague as I just mentioned above. This was when I was a little bit more newer to the game, but I'll never forget this one. Oh, and forgive me, I have so many stories and experiences to share with you that I'm kind of just recalling them as I write this, so please bear with me. And if I forget some good ones, I'll be sure to follow up with you in a different email. But anyway, I'll continue. This other colleague and I just discovered what we believed to be a tunnel that we weren't sure where it led to. 
This wasn't just a cavern or a tunnel that was created out of rock. This was dug and created by a larger animal. The entrance to this tunnel was maybe only three feet in height and probably the same in width. Enough that if I were to get on all fours, I could probably crawl through. What really bothered me and my colleagues so much was that we had heard a person screaming. Well, actually several people screaming that led us to this tunnel entrance. We believed to have heard the screaming inside the tunnel. We couldn't exactly dictate how far into the tunnel we heard the noise, but it was clear as day, a person screaming. We had yelled back, waiting for a response, but received none, and the overwhelming odor of rotting flesh and death bellowed out of this tunnel like no tomorrow. We had called for backup, and the people who ended up going into that tunnel, the rescue team, whoever was in there, never got to them. They crawled about a half mile in and came back out and said there was no signs of anybody, just a tunnel that continued with lots and lots of human bones. The screaming had come to a halt the entire time these individuals began crawling through the tunnel to try and rescue what they thought was people. And when they got to the end, they said it just kept going and that it was futile. I don't know if this is exactly ethical or if it was supposed to happen this way, but they seem really disturbed by the whole incident, like they saw something in those tunnels they don't want to talk about and that they wrote it off. They were pale as ghosts upon exiting, and these are trained rescue men and women that do this on a daily basis. I guess it should be commonplace to be disturbed by many of the experiences that we all have out here, but some of these men and women that do these jobs are hardy individuals and are not put off easily. I've told some of these stories to my close friends in which they'll always ask me, what do I think about it? What do I think it was, etc. To answer simply, I don't have an explanation because I really don't know. I have no thought to even what would cause such a thing. Some information that I was let in on was that many satanic rituals are performed deep in the woods and I don't feel comfortable giving out exact locations some of my older friends and colleagues that I've worked with for years can tell you all the hot spots that these go on at, all around the areas of the Northwest, down to California, where even more freaky occurrences happen. I was told about some of them, but to help protect your audience, in case you do read this to them and they want to go explore, I'm not going to disclose any of those locations, like I just said. Just know that these occur and are at very specific locations miles and miles out into the woods, for good reason. There is also designated ritual spots where ritual sacrifices are performed often and seem to be the hotbed of demonic and unknown entity activity. I myself have experienced apparitions walking to the woods only to turn and disappear. Suicide is another very common thing you tend to find out in the wilderness. I've had years where I've had to cut down over 20 people in one summer and other years where I've only had to cut down one or two the whole year. It varies from state to state and year to year. I know it might be disturbing to some to know that this happens, but it's more common than you think. We've also had to discover people who've decided to jump off a 300 foot cliff onto stone and have splattered all over. I can't tell you the exact time that I became disheartened and numb to these things, but eventually, you just kind of get used to being in uncomfortable situations. Doesn't make it easier, but I feel like it's a job that has to be done. Since we're on the topic of death and suicide, we have also found things out in the wild, like a human heart and even a human brain. The first organ I found myself was a human eye, 100% clean of any dirt and very well preserved, as if just plucked out. I have not found a body organ or piece of a person that looked to be really like it had been rotting or had been sitting out in the sun too long. Every organ or body part I found is always fresh. That's what I don't understand. I shouldn't say that completely because we have found people and body parts that have clearly been decayed and have been outside for a while, but there are just some that just send chills down your spine because it doesn't make any logical sense. It leads you to understand there's something going on 
that you will never fully know and never fully grasp. Something I should also address is that I've been asked before on sites like Reddit and Quora and even in person if I have ever encountered anything like stairs in the woods like so many creepypastas used to do. To that, I would say yes, but let me clarify and explain my response. I haven't discovered a random set of stairs in the middle of nowhere with them leading to nothing, but I have experienced on one occasion a stairwell that went down to the ground that led into an old abandoned basement of a dilapidated, non-existent house. I shouldn't say non-existent, but the only thing that remained of this old house was the concrete foundation, and even that was not fully intact. The basement, though, remained fully intact somehow, probably due to being cut off of contact of weathering and any animals. The basement also seemed to be below the flooring of the foundation, staying well preserved. The doorway to the basement was so old and rotted that it was stuck in place, unless you budged hard enough. There are times where your inner explorer comes out, and when you come across these things, you kinda want to venture into the unknown, even if it's just for a moment. This was an instance where I started going down the steps toward this old door, because I've passed by this dilapidated used-to-be house several times, and as I stepped down those steps, I got the worst feeling you can imagine. Like my entire being was screaming at me to not open that door and to go down there. It was like every negative emotion you could possibly feel all in one concentrated feeling. I've talked to my friends and colleagues about the same area, and one of the older gentlemen that I worked with explained to me that the basement used to be a ritualistic sacrifice area for demonic summoning. I'm not sure how much truth is held to that. The older gentleman in which I spoke to about that has far more experience than I with dealing with such occurrences. I feel like for me, one of the most frightening aspects of this job is not just the things you encounter or the experiences that you might have. It's the fact that every day you go out there and do your job knowing that you can make a mistake that might cost lives. I know these things are out there, and if you're not careful, you might be a victim yourself. Being aware of everything I've kind of told you about doesn't exclude you to the dangers of being in that environment that we are commonly in. This is why so many newbies don't last long. I've seen too many younglings come into the field, bright and happy, spend a little bit of time and get their feet wet and decide it's not for them. Some of them are in it far too long before they realize it's late. There's a lot to handle on a job like this and feel like they're trapped. Speaking of trapped, another story I wanted to relate to you before I forgot as it had just came to me. Years back, we had a very interesting situation with an eight-year-old boy who had wandered off the trail from his family and had gotten lost for five days. They were about to call off the search when they had found him alive nearly 20 miles away from the spot that he was said to have been lost with his family. He was casually playing by a small creek, having no fear or cares in the world. He was not filthy. In fact, his clothes were clean and he looked like he had been eating well. His family was overjoyed to say the least, to discover his end was not gruesome and that he was well and happy. When we asked him what happened, he talked about a large bear man that grabbed him and kept him safe. Puzzled, he was pressed further with questions. What big bear? He said this large bear, much bigger than him with a man-like face, brought him there feeding him cooked meat and berries and letting him sleep in its arms in other warm spots. This bear had made him a home. When we asked if the bear showed any signs of aggression or ill behavior towards the boy, he declined. He said this bear was very friendly. When we asked if the bear was around when we found him, he said the bear had trotted off to go find something to eat and that the bear even spoke to him and told him what to do to stay safe. It's stories like that that you can't really come to a definitive conclusion to. Something grabbed him, and why he was targeted, I don't know. I've heard some things like in Missing 411, where children are targeted because of their brightly colored clothing, or perhaps they were a vulnerable and easy target. This kid was in dark camo clothing 
and was a chubbier, bigger boy. The fact he would describe it as being a larger than his father and a big bear, looking like a bear but having a face like a man, really didn't give us a whole lot to go on. We're not sure how to explain how he made it 20 miles away from where he was last seen, virtually unscathed. The terrain between where he was last seen and where he was found had many rough areas of terrain, including, but not limited to, rivers and streams, but also sharp inclines with lots of rock and thick, thick bramble. There's no way this little boy made it all the way out there himself in the condition that he was in. When pressed further on the issue of how this bear took him all the way out there, he said the bear just held on to him and jumped from tree to tree, and that he had been out there for days playing together an incredibly disturbing account for all of us. After this happened, I had become aware of other very similar situations that have happened with other smaller children. Being taken and sometimes being found alive with very similar descriptions of what happened and who or what took them. I'm not sure that we will ever know exactly what is happening out there. Many of us have tried to set up game cams and spots we know that nobody goes or potential hot spots where we've had sightings or other bizarre experiences. Here is the weird part. Every time we've ever tried to do this, either one or two things happens. One, the game cams themselves are gone with no trace of where or who they were taken by. I'm not talking ripped off the tree and smashed, just gone. Somebody or something took them, and this has happened more than once. Or two, this has happened less frequently, but still happens. The cameras will still be perfectly in place, undisturbed, but the SD cards will be nowhere to be found. We have not yet to retrieve a game cam with an SD card still in it, and we probably tried at least 15 times now over the past few years. This only happens though in certain areas because if you set up a game cam in more populated areas where there are campers, there's usually more wildlife like deer and raccoons, and doesn't really seem to be any sort of bizarre activity. But stick it in an area where there are sightings or experiences of things beyond our explanation, and the game cams will go missing. I honestly wish I can give you answers to everything I've told you, because I frankly don't have any. I still remember about five years in after having a handful of experiences myself, thinking that since the Native Americans lived so much in these woods and throughout the country, that they certainly have at least the same handful of encounters that I have had. I have since gotten to talk to some elders of tribes that I will not mention for the sake of their protection that do indeed have far worse encounters than what I have had. They keep these things hidden away from not only us, but their people out of fear and to keep their people still thriving. But they are not immune to what is out there. If anything, they are much more alert, respectful, and aware that they share the woods with other things. It is true that even people have fallen victim to the same things many of our people have. It is true that even their people have fallen victim to the same things many of our people have. Missing persons, finding body parts, half or whole of a person, or never seeing somebody ever again. In fact, I would even go as far as to say they are more wise because they know to avoid certain situations, and more importantly, avoid certain red areas. They know what energy lurks in these areas. We've had various guests leave multiples of these parks that I worked at, complaining and leaving in fear of things they have seen themselves. I'm not just talking about translucent beings, bright lights in the sky, or weird feelings of energy and magneticism. I'm talking about actual sightings. I've heard it all, from Bigfoot, Dogmen, to other more elusive creatures like demons and even Black Panthers. I think it's important for all of your listeners to understand exactly what I've been stating this entire time, that if you're going to go camping or hiking or gallivanting into the wilderness, whether it be a national forest or just an untouched piece of land, you need to be prepared for what is inside of it. For too long, people continue to ignore what's really in the woods, hidden behind certainty and a false sense of bravery because they feel like they've spent so much time in the wilderness without anything happening. 
well guess again. Remember folks, all it takes is once, and all these people that have disappeared or have had an encounter or a sighting have the same stance as you do before it happened. The forest is not our place, and we must respect it. This email ended up much longer than what I had hoped for, so sit back and buckle up and enjoy what I have to tell you, because it wasn't enjoyable for me to experience. Anyway, when I went camping with a couple of friends a few summers back, I believe I experienced a Bigfoot, but I know that Bigfoots don't fly and have wings, so I'm not exactly sure what this falls under. I'm aware of Bigfoot's existence, and my family has had a few run-ins with them here and there. I didn't necessarily have a personal run-in with one of these things, but I did hear a sound that I would want to believe is a Bigfoot, but maybe not. I think it was more shocking for my friend, who apparently encountered this thing, and being a non-believer, that changed that night, for sure. We went camping, up around Mount St. Helens for the weekend, to party a little bit, and to let loose. Our day-to-day -day jobs and life, in general, was just getting too stressful, so we needed a good getaway. The camping trip turned out normal for the most part, until nightfall. We were all getting ready to crack open some beers when we heard this earth-shattering scream off to the east of us in the timber. We all looked confused and unsure of what we had just heard. We started talking that it kind of sounded like a really large bat, but we were unsure. It creeped us out, but we quickly forgot about it and had some fun hanging out by the fire and drinking some good beer. Washington State, for those of you that don't know, is home to some great microbrews, so we were enjoying trying all different kinds. The night went on fairly peacefully, and we were getting ready to retire to our tents to get some sleep. My buddies went in their tents after taking a piss and brushing their teeth, and I retired to mine. I wasn't quite ready for bed yet. I hadn't drank enough to shut my brain down, so I thought I would sit on my phone for a little while in my sleeping bag. I was lying there on my phone, dinking around on some games. I don't think it was long before I had heard some of my buddies snoring in their tent. I guess that's what happens when you drink too much. I like to stay on the conservative side of drinking so I can actually enjoy myself, but to each their own. After listening to my friends snore, I realized there was no cricket sounds like there was earlier. The night was completely silent, except for loud snoring. I began listening closely, and I could not hear any life outside. No crickets, no sounds, no wind even. That was odd to me, but I didn't think anything about it. I checked my phone, and it was around 11.49 PM. Hoping I could fall asleep soon, boom! I heard this massive thundering crashing sound from not far away. It shot me right up from my sleeping bag. I turned on my phone's flashlight, quickly looking around beyond my tent to see if I could spot anything. It was dark and there was nothing. The woods were still, dead and quiet. The only light was the dull, dead glowing embers off the fire that we had had earlier. It straight up sounded like a boulder or something falling out of the sky and crashing into a tree. It was so loud. So, I was starting to freak out. I sat there for a moment with my phone's flashlight just shining out towards the darkness, as if expecting to see something in the three or so light of feet that I had. Maybe in hindsight, I was just waiting for peace and quiet to feel reassured. That's when I heard that bone-chilling scream again. It sounded like a very loud, deep bat, kind of. That's the closest I can think of something that would match its timbre and tone. It too was incredibly loud. I could feel the vibrations from it in my chest. My friend who was once snoring away is shouting my name in a hushed whisper. I'm trying to call out to him and ask if he had heard what I had just heard. He says yeah, that it woke him up. What in God's name is that? Some sort of dying animal? And I told him I had no idea, but it's freaking me out and I don't have any desire to go and find out. But I did have one problem. I had to piss like a horse before a race, and I had zero bottles in my tent, or otherwise I would have just pissed in it and called it good. 
My good friend, bless his heart, likes to think he's brave, but a lot of the time, I think he's just a dumbass. Little did I know, he's like, I'm pissed. I was having a dream about my ex, and that stupid screeching woke me up. Let's go show it who's boss. I brought my 45 with me, and it's got a bullet that's looking to kill. I told him you're crazy for going out there in the middle of the night without much light at all and looking for the source of unknown noise. I think he was still partially intoxicated. I'm not sure. I, on the other hand, was 100% sober before I even went to bed as I like to drink beer for enjoyment and don't care for being drunk. While there was a pause in conversation, I thought maybe if I went out there a little with him, it might be a good chance for me to go piss on a tree or something. My other two buddies who remained asleep during this somehow were still snoring away. They brought some hard liquor and were passed out. I don't even think that Mount St. Helens erupting a second time would have woken those two up. I really didn't want to go out there into the darkness, but I needed a pee and someone had to accompany my idiot friend who thought he was going to play hero. So, I felt obligated. I stood up out of my tent and was met with him outreaching his hand to pull me out of the tent. I had told him I didn't need help getting out. I was just fine. He kind of laughed, thinking I was drunk or something. He too had his flashlight in his hand and his big 45, aka hand cannon in the other. I told him, Geez, do you really need to bring that bazooka out here? Wouldn't a handgun been enough? He looked down at his weapon and explained a handgun ain't going to stop a bear. This will. I should have reasoned with him more to not bring such an overpowered weapon to a simple camping trip, but this man practices his shooting almost daily and is an incredibly good shot. He might have had his moments of stupidity, but he knew what he was doing especially when handling extremely powerful and dangerous weapons. I think he might have gotten a little too cocky, as I recall asking him if he's too intoxicated to be handling a firearm. He told me he was fine, to which I just responded, whatever. The woods were still silent, and I pointed him to the tree that I was going to piss on, probably about 20 feet away from his tent. He nods and points in the direction of the sound we heard earlier, saying, I'm going to go that way and see what I can find. If it really was a boulder falling out of the sky, we would probably see it. I stumble over to the tree with just my phone flashlight as I hear my friend quietly walking over off into the darkness. I pull it out and begin to mark this tree as my own. Don't think I was brave. I was paranoid as hell looking around. I hadn't heard a noise like that and I was very, very spooked. My friend seemed very blinded by bravery, thinking that because he had a flashlight and a magnum, he was indestructible. He trails off into the trees, enough to where I can't see him as much. He keeps stopping and looking around frantically, but it doesn't look like he's finding much of anything. I zip my pants back up and head back for my tent. When I go to get into my tent, I just get this incredible feeling of guilt that I should go and grab my friend and bring him back to his tent. I'm sure he's still partially intoxicated. As a friend, it's my duty to ensure he's not doing stupid stuff, especially with a high-powered weapon. I remember cursing his name because I didn't want to walk out 100 feet with a dinky flashlight on my phone to grab his stubborn ass, but my stupid consciousness wouldn't just let me go and crash out like I wanted. Regretfully, I just started walking over towards him calling his name out and asking if he had found anything. He wasn't responding. After maybe a minute or two, or three of walking through the trees, I walk up next to him as he's intently shining his flashlight around up in the trees, looking for any signs that point to a source of the crashing noise. I asked him if he had seen anything yet, and he just looks at me, puts his finger to his lips in a shushing motion. I'm curious too now, we're both looking around. Nothing. The woods are still dead silent though, and it's pretty spooky. He's shining his light all around, but nothing. We're not seeing a damn thing. Neither of us could really shake the intense feelings of being watched, so much so that it was overwhelming. 
I motioned for him to just give up and turn around. Let's head back to the tent, since there is clearly nothing out here to see. He wouldn't budge. He just kept looking up in the trees and all around us. It was almost like he was in a trance. It was bizarre. After a minute or two of trying to get him to just come back to the tent and go to sleep, I said screw it and walked back myself. Literally, I'm three feet from the tent and about to unzip to get in, and I hear him scream bloody murder. Boom! He fires a shot, and then I hear the most screeching loud roar I've ever heard in my life. It was kind of like if you took a lion's roar and combined it with a bat and put it through one of those massive loudspeakers you'd see at a big amphitheater. My stomach at that very moment sank to the bottom of my feet. He comes sprinting back in my direction and I'm screaming, what the hell happened? In one solid motion, he runs towards me and leaps around me into the truck, grabs his keys and starts it up. Now I'm freaking out, chasing after him, hopping in the truck, yelling at him. Are you crazy? What's going on? You can't just leave our other two buddies here. He puts it in drive and floors it out of the area. He's just gunning his truck as hard as he can, flooring it on primitive roads and gravel. And I'm trying to calm him down and get him to stop, but he wouldn't even acknowledge me. I'm screaming at him that he has to go back. You have to go back and grab our friends and all of our stuff. He turns to me and screams a few choice words that I won't repeat. I don't know how long this went on for until he made it to a more paved road area. We had been in the car for a minute at this point. I couldn't give you an exact estimate of time, but he just stops the car, puts it in park, eyes wide and trembling, gripping the steering wheel so tightly I thought he was going to tear it off. With how fast he was going through all that gravel and brush, I'm surprised he did not total the truck or bust an axle. I'm still freaking out at him, screaming what is going on. We have to go back. What are you doing? Are you crazy? He finally turns to me and says quietly, and I'll never forget this moment. You couldn't pay me enough to go back there and face that thing. I'm scared. I'm terrified. I have no idea what is going on and what the hell he's talking about. I want you to understand that this is two grown men in our shirts and boxers. He still has his 45 in one hand, and his other hand is gripping the steering wheel. I thought he was on the verge of a mental breakdown. I had never seen him like this. We're sitting in his truck in the middle of nowhere in the night, on an older paved road, out in God knows where. He literally just drove through half gravel, half forced, and I'm trying to process what the hell had just happened. He all of a sudden opens his driver's side door and just bolts off into the night. Here I am screaming at him, screaming his name. Where are you going? Come back. I'm screaming and yelling and nothing. Listen, I know this might sound totally outlandish, but I swear this is what happened. The truck is still running and now I'm freaking out because I don't know what the hell to do. All my stuff is back in my tent, so there's nothing I can do. After sitting for a minute, I realize the only thing I can do is try to look for him. So I hop over into the driver's side and start to drive up and down this road, looking for him, calling his name in the direction that he ran. But he's nowhere to be found. I sure as hell was not going to go out and trek in the middle of the woods and just my boxers. I'm on the verge of a breakdown myself. I don't know what was going on. We just went from hanging out and having a great time to him seeing something hearing a roar, firing a shot, and running like a maniac into the truck and flipping out. I had no explanation for the scream we had heard either. At this point in the night, that was the last thing I was thinking about. After driving back and forth, I was just going to try and go back to our campsite and grab everything and my friends, tell them what happened, and call a ranger to come help us. This was far too much for me to handle. Turns out that my friend was driving so hard through the brush and off the beaten road, he did damage his axle slightly. Luckily, we weren't far off from where we were camping, and without totally breaking down, I was able to make it back to where our camp spot was. Both of my friends were outside, freaking the hell out, wanting to know where we went. I explained the story to them, that my friend, which, by the way, if you haven't noticed, 
I have purposefully not been naming any of their names out of protection for their identity. He saw something off in the woods, heard something, ran into his truck, bolted off into the night, and went crazy. In a blur of a frenzy, we just threw everything in the bed of the truck and got out of there so fast to go looking for our friend. I don't think I've ever in my life packed up camp so quickly, but we somehow managed to pull it off. We jumped back in his truck and took off towards the main road we were just at prior. I don't recall a moment of calm or relaxation at all during this entire tenure. It was stress, worry, anxiety, every negative emotion you can muster into a few hour time span. So much so that I kind of blacked a lot of it out, to be honest. We get back to the road and get out of the truck and start calling and yelling for him, but we don't hear from him. I think we drove the next couple of hours around looking for him until we decided to give up and get a ranger to come help us like I wanted to originally. I could bore you with more drawn out details of our failed search for our friend, driving around all night and calling for him with little to no sleep, stress and worry about what we all endured the night prior, but I'll spare you those. Fast forward to hours later and we were able to get a hold of a park ranger. We explained the situation, only mentioning that our friend went crazy, was armed and took off into the woods in the middle of the night. We had been searching for him for hours and never found him. Moving forward again, we eventually found him in the early morning hours, just as the sun was coming out, about three miles or so where he originally ran off at. When they found him, he was in a state of shock, panic, and acting as this man had completely lost it. Huddled up against the base of a tree, whispering nonsense to himself and holding his gun and rocking back and forth. He was transferred to a hospital but was released the following day because he checked out just fine, because he might have experienced a total emotional and mental breakdown. He had gone through a complete psyche eval, but improved his condition within the time there. When prodded with questions and trying to find out what was going on, he just kept talking about a giant bat. I know, confusing. Nobody could really get more information out of him at the time. Skip ahead again, about a month later, and none of us had really talked to him. We all just kind of thought he lost it and went off the deep end for a while. Well, when I finally got the chance to have a real conversation with the man again, I wanted to know what happened. I needed to have some closure on the events that night. I feel like for the first time, he was really able to tell me what he experienced and said that it forever altered his life. He said when I had left, off to a pocket of trees he somehow missed with his light was what he explained to be something from hell. I asked him what he meant by something from hell. He shrugged and wouldn't even look at me. I'll never forget his tenseness and demeanor changed almost instantaneously, so much so that I could see his skin crawl from five feet away. I begged him to elaborate, saying that it resembled this nasty, humongous, hairy bat. He just said it was a demon that he knew was going to come for him and take him away. He said it was watching him intently, and he knew that it meant nothing but harm. He fired a shot at it, and it flew off in his direction. He explained that whatever this thing was had massive teeth, claws, and was enormous in size, bigger and taller than him, had glowing red eyes that pierced into his soul, and even said that he felt like it was trying to talk to him telepathically, to tell him how it was going to get him. Once he fired that shot at it, he swears he hit it, but it flew off in his direction, which is why he ran. How or why it didn't grab him, he has no idea. At the moment, I consider this to be the ramblings of a possible schizophrenic having a hallucination. I hate to be that way, but what he was explaining to me was just so far removed from any reality I knew and lived in. The only problem here is that I too heard the howl, that scream, whatever he was talking about. It was loud, and it didn't sound like any animal I had ever heard of. I really don't have a way to explain what it was but it did sound somewhat like a raspy deep bat. I'm not exactly sure, but I can tell you it terrified me in that moment that it occurred. I have no way to explain it. I don't know how to justify what happened, but he truly believes that what he saw is what he saw 
and it was real. And what he saw is the thing that made the sound. We actually didn't spend a whole lot of time on the subject because I can tell that it really shook him up bad. Which, again, to me was very odd. This was a guy who would do extreme things and was never bothered by much. If someone like him reacts this way, it just kind of told me there really was something there. I mean, I know he's not totally insane. We both heard the screams. As for my other two friends that attended the trip, they didn't hear a damn thing. They were only awakened by all the commotion of us taking off the first time. They didn't see anything. I wish I had more to tell you, something concrete and conclusive, but I don't. Just that what we experienced, we can't explain. Whatever my friend went through shook him so badly that I hadn't been able to do anything in the outdoors with him since, and it's kind of just changed his personality. I'm still not sure how I feel about all of it. I guess I'm still skeptical, but my mind just keeps going back to that horrid sounding scream. Maybe there's truth to what he said. Maybe there is such a thing as hell, and this is where that thing came from. I don't normally give thought to things that are outside of my reality, but maybe it's time I start. Sorry for the long story, just wanted you to hear my experience. This is an encounter I had several years ago deer hunting during gun season in rural West Virginia. I was hunting on my aunt and uncle's land. I was situated in a tree stand on top of a ridge line and could see down into either side. Visibility was limited, though, due to brush and trees. It was a little after daybreak and all the shooting had started. All of a sudden, I hear this massive crashing through the underbrush in front of me, headed down in between the two ridge lines. Whatever this was, was walking on two legs clearly from the sound of it, and it was big. I couldn't see much other than a large dark shape running through the brush. I've heard hunters before trying to flush deer that had bedded down, and this wasn't that. It was something running to get away from something. The neighbors on that side were too old to hunt and do this. To my knowledge, nobody was in the woods that direction of my stand. I didn't get a clear look at whatever it was, but I know it was walking on two legs and either dark brown or black in color. Haven't seen it since then, and I'm not sure if it's even still there now. I just know it was unnerving at the time. My dad even mentioned it to me when we met for lunch and asked if it was me or if I saw who it was. I told him what I saw and heard, and he just said, huh, well that's weird. I don't know if it was a Bigfoot or some other humanoid. Also, for reference, this was close to the Mothman sightings, but it wasn't the Mothman that much I know. I have been hesitant to write about these incidents. I do not want to be labeled a loon, I do not know what is coming in my house, but I do know that it is not human. To begin, I live in a small town. Not much happens with the exception of meth heads murdering each other. I have been visited by something with such frequency that I noticed a pattern. It always occurs during the week of the full moon. I cannot see it, but I smell a strong odor of dried, decaying flowers and a sickly sweet earthly decay smell. Sometimes it is so strong around me that I get nauseous. Very overwhelming. That being said, I don't know what it is. I am not afraid of it. I get the feeling it is watching me, but I am not afraid. But whatever it is, my cats stare in the direction of it, which is very off-putting. I'm not crazy. I also check outside in daylight hours. I'm no idiot to see if there is any dead animals, but there's none. There, this has been happening for at least two years, and I am just curious to y'all's thoughts. I do live over underground in tunnels in my town, running to all the old civil defense buildings used as bomb shelters. Anything could be there. Last thing, weird and wonderful things happen to me all the time. What's your take?
Normally, I'm not a believer in what I'd call fictitious fairy tales like werewolves, vampires, and such. But I will acknowledge when I find proof of the existence of unknown animals that I didn't previously believe in. I've spent a lot of my time in the Sierra Nevada mountain range, exploring and looking for caves to dive into. I've camped out there many times. I've heard all sorts of wild, hairy tales. Things that will make your skin crawl. I, too, have found evidence to believe that there might be a predator at large that's far more potent than your typical mountain lion or black bear. I've come to find evidence of what I would best support the hypothesis that there is indeed a large alpha predator, more likely a wolf that dominates much of the range on this mountain. I've heard stories where people talk about seeing bright lights, or even Bigfoot. I can't confirm nor deny any of that. I myself have had zero experiences with all of that. What I can confirm is the things that I know I have found that I cannot explain, and evidence that would point to a large, upright walking predatory wolf. The first major player in the evidence that I've mustered is finding large canid prints in multiple spots on my trek. There's one major component to these tracks, and it's that they don't adhere to your standard wolf size tracks. Your standard wolf track, on average, is around 4 inches in width and height. These that I've found are easily doubled, if not a little larger than double, and the indent is very visibly noticeable. This leans toward the fact that whatever large canine made this is not only larger, but much heavier due to a deeper indent into the soil. Here's where things get even hairier. They don't follow your typical quadrupedal pattern that a dog or a wolf would follow. They are bipedal by the pattern, following a two-step pattern with a four to five foot stride. Massive strides. Does this support that there is some sort of large upright walking wolf around these parts? I am not sure myself, although the evidence I've found seems to strongly show support of that for my findings. The real kicker to it all is I have found four to five sets in total of these same large canid bipedal style footprints throughout my time out here, all in varying locations and different spots. I struggle with the concept because I believe that if a wolf was to walk bipedally, it would walk like a bear in the sense where they only walk for a short distance. But the longest stretch of tracks I found went on for well over 15 feet. All of these tracks were much in the same with indentation into the dirt, size, stride, and stepping pattern. It's possible that there could be a large pack of wolves out there that have grown to an abnormal size, learning to walk bipedally for short distances at a time. I have never found sets of tracks where it's more than just one. These are all just singular wolves that I've found on my time out. That is just one, what I like to call set of evidence, if you will. Now, I'm not saying what I'm about to tell you is necessarily evidence leaning towards my hypothesis, but it makes you wonder what's going on. What's killing these animals in the way they're being killed? I have discovered multiple deer and two black bears on account, dead. To dive into details a little more, I'm going to discuss with you the black bear deaths. Black bears do inhibit these mountain ranges, and although I don't see them as much, I do know they are here. I respect their space and that this is their home. To my knowledge and understanding, black bears don't have any predators that are above them. They don't have to worry about being killed due to them being omnivores and their size and stature alone is enough to ward away mountain lions, for example. I'm sure a mountain lion and a bear have gotten into it before in nature, but I wouldn't put it past me, but I don't believe that is how these two black bear that I found were killed. I had come to almost a small valley where there is more tree coverage and lots of rock. Great as a protective enclosure, with a small little cavern-like den. I had stumbled upon an actual black bear den. If I hadn't traveled down a 50 feet steep rocky incline of this hill into this little pocket of an area, I wouldn't have found what I did. Outside this small bear den, 
I know it was because I did check out the den after finding these bears. I discovered the cadavers of what looked to be two deceased black bears. The manner in which these black bears were killed was gruesome to say the least. Both bears were within 10 feet of each other, killed by an unknown and unforeseen predator. The larger black bear, what I believed to be a male, but I didn't check, only judging by its size, had its head completely torn off its body. There was no head to be found anywhere around the area or visible vicinity that I was in. All along its body was large, deep gashes that looked to come from claws of great size. It was a bloody mess. Although the blood was coagulated, you could tell whatever happened that this bear suffered severe damage. The other bear, which lay no more than 10 feet away from the other bear, appeared to be smaller in size and frame. My guess was a female. As with the first, I didn't think in the moment to check the genitalia. The similarities and damage to this were mainly the deep gash wounds all over its body. It made me think of grizzly bear gashes, how they're so long and run so deep. These bears' body were shredded. The claw pattern wasn't even that of a bear though. It was different. If we're being honest, the flesh was far too mangled to get an accurate look as to what any claw pattern was exactly. The difference between the two bear is that this one was smaller, had its entire throat torn out. There was a lot of dried blood around it. Both of these bears had just died within the last day, judging by the freshness of the kill, so they were still rather fresh. Had I not wandered down into this area, I wouldn't have caught this grisly scene. Sorry about the pun. I just wanted to shed some light into a bleak scenario. The smell of decay hadn't even hit me until I wandered into here. The tree coverage and enclosure was so thick with rocks, it was almost encasing this area loosely, if that makes sense. I can see why it made for the perfect den spot. Anyhow, after spending maybe a few moments observing these dead bear and looking for any clues, I found bits of long, stringy black hair. This hair did not belong to the bears, but something else. I found it in small clumps and random sizes around the general radius of, I'd say 20 feet around us if I had to guess. The dirt beneath our feet was disturbed. I could see there were tracks of both bear and another animal, but I couldn't make out anything distinct. There had been too much ruffled dirt. It was clear there was some sort of fight, a struggle, and something some form of mountain predator tore these bears to shreds, ripped off the head of one and tore the throat out of another. Last I checked, mountain lions don't kill like this, especially not two black bears. Their claw size also wasn't capable of making the gashes that I saw. These were huge. The entire scene of this upset me so much, I had to get out of there and fast. I figured whatever did this to these bears was still close enough to this area. So I'm left with the question, what does that to a black bear? I always thought black bears were pretty much never challenged by other animals. I guess I'm wrong. Then I think about large canid tracks that I've seen over the years, and I can't help but put two and two together. I have never seen anything like the black bear seen since then or before. I'm not sure if those tracks have anything to do with what killed those bear, but I speculate it might. If the tracks I found really do belong to some unknown upright walking canid that lives out there, you're talking about a several hundred pound canid predator. Wolves themselves are large, so something more than double its size and bipedal. Now that's scary. Who knows what kind of damage, if exists, this animal could truly be capable of. The last and only other out of place findings I've really had have been deer. I found deer dead in all various ways of being killed, just in the mountains of course, which is the context here, where I primarily spend much of my time. I've seen them with their throats torn out and mangled, which could easily be explained by the current standard predators in the area. Then there are the ones that I find are stranger than fiction. Two ways, actually. The first is I've only found maybe four in total like this, but these deer are ripped to pieces. Quite literally, I mean that. 
torn to shreds. Whatever killed it didn't even bother to eat it, only tear it to pieces, including its guts and all. Some of them were more disemboweled than the others, but they were generally just ripped apart. The worst one I found was a young deerling, slightly older and larger than just a little fawn. All four legs ripped off its body. The body was ripped in half with intestines spilling. Head and neck were both ripped off and apart. Part of the face was smashed in from the left side, and it looked to be smashed by a large rock to me. This small fawn, like the rest of the other deer I saw that died this way, are found within a small space, no more than 30 feet from each body part. It too was a bloody mess, as all of them are. Of course, my spacing estimates are just guesses, of course. Nothing is ever formulaic. This fawn had to be there for a few days, so it was decaying thoroughly. But surprisingly, there seemed to be no predators that had come and taken the free meal. The fawn didn't even appear to be eaten on, just butchered. Some of the other deer I found were in fresher states of decay, as all the kills I find are usually fresher. Probably because, out there, the bodies can decay so quickly due to climate. The same case was said for the other deer that I had found. Virtually zero signs that they were eaten on by not only what killed them, but anything other than maggots since. There is zero known predators that will kill a deer, tear it to pieces this way, and not eat on any of the meat. I see no reason, any logical reason why any predator would waste food in that way, considering it takes time and energy of the predator to take down a prey. Biologically and by nature's law, it doesn't make sense. It's something I'm still researching and looking into. What animal kills prey aggressively just for the sake of killing? Number two, the other way that I'll find them dead is far more disturbing in my opinion, just because of how unnatural the death itself is. I found more like this than I have torn to pieces. These ones die and have random parts of their body cut open or missing parts of their body with no signs of blood in fact, the first doe I found had both of her front legs and right calf and right half of her face gone. They looked to be perfectly cut out, like a fine laser or something. No drop of blood, and the body had begun to mummify under the sun. There were zero signs of decay other than that. No flies, no signs of maggots, not even an odor of death or decay actually no signs of predators even coming to check out the cadaver. This doe was probably a week old dead, if I had to guess. It was just lying there in the middle of a small clearing, higher up in elevation. Other deer I found that were killed in this manner had very similar death patterns. Another one I found had its entire neck and head missing. Bigger doe it looked like, but the same as the first. No blood, no signs of decay, or flies or maggots not even predators, no smell of rot or death, and the cut once again looked surgical in nature. It was extremely clean, not a single imperfection was made. They were so clean that it looked to be man-made. At the elevation I was at, I had no answers for these happenings because I go to areas not others go to. Why would somebody be out here taking pieces of deer? It just doesn't add up to me. That also does not explain the strangeness of it all. No smell, no animal or insect touching the body. It's weird to me. Things just don't die and not give off an odor. All of this paired with the killings of both bears is kind of frightening to say the least. Adding the deer in and assuming there's all one big grand connection here, don't mind the conspiracy. This might be some sort of undiscovered lone canid alpha predator. I'm no stranger to the weirdness that goes on in these mountains, along with many other mountains in the country that are notorious for UFOs, Bigfoot, and other things of that nature. I know the natives out here have many stories about these mountains, as well as a plethora of explorers and hikers alike. However, the things I've told you about are really the only encounters that I put in that category of mysterious. Everything else has just been pure survival in the wilderness. For me, to believe there is something, there needs to be a strong, suited sense of evidence for that something. 
That's how I've always lived by, and this situation is no exception. I cannot deny the evidence that there is something that is somewhat canid. I have no idea what it is, and others that I have talked to and spoke to don't seem to know or have an idea. Everything I know and have heard points in the direction that it is not an existent animal currently. Then we go back to the deer and the bear situation. That's very unnatural of any predator to do, whether it to be another predator or its prey. Maybe this is all a part of the weird stuff that goes on. I will continue to be vigilant, aware, and respectful of my surroundings of the animals and places around me. This value is held true, especially when I am out in those mountains. I can't say or for a fact what I've pieced together is indeed a real living creature, although it very much so is in my head. But it is definitely evidence that is based on something. What I'm not sure, I can only hope to find those answers as time goes on. I come from a family of hunters. It was not uncommon for my mom and stepdad to go out early morning and not come home until well into the night on occasion. In rural Georgia, it is fairly common for landowners to lease out their acres for hunting to different folks depending on the seasonality and the type of hunting they are doing, and deer season for archers begins at the end of summer. My mother has this story that I love to hear as a child that, as an adult, had a horrifying twist. One afternoon, my parents struck out to hunt for the day. The land they leased that particular year ran alongside a power line route. These routes are clear cut through woods and create a man-made field. A hunter can set their tree stands up in the thickets of surrounding these fields and waiting for grazing animals to come by. Around dusk, my mom started to look out for my stepdad to come and pick her up. He would usually help her get situated in her stand, then go and find his and set up further down the trail. As the sun began to sink, she saw him walking down the power line clearing. My stepdad is a brawlic type man that has a wide gait in his walk. He swings his arm a bit as he walks. I mean, it's kind of similar to a caveman to me. Even in the low sinking light, she could make out his silhouette and could see that he was zigzagging from side to side of the clear cut field. He'd obviously forgotten where they had set her stand up and was trying to find her. So she stood up, waved her hands to get his attention. At that moment, the creature she thought was my stepdad noticed her. It dropped down to all fours and darted into the woods, making a strange low growl as it did. She waited for what seemed like an eternity for my stepdad to come and get her. She was terrified and in tears. This story was shared many times in my childhood, and when I asked for a scary hunting story, they have plenty of them. It's not that I didn't believe my mom, but we all know that the night can play tricks on us and heighten our imagination. So, when I asked for this story in my teenage years, imagine my surprise when my stepdad spoke up. A man of few words and a lack of imagination, he raised his head at the dinner table. I've never told either of you this, but I think I probably should. That night, the creature wasn't running away from your mother. I was walking along the line of the woods toward her tree stand when I noticed it. I smelt it before I actually saw the thing. It had a pungent odor, almost skunk-like, and it seemed to be a little over six foot tall, covered in thick, coarse hair. It saw me about the same time as I drew back an arrow to take aim. At first it growled and then dropped to all fours and sprinted towards me as I released the arrow, knocking it in the arm. I was shaking and just missed the intended hit. The animal veered to the side and kept running. To this day, I wonder what that creature was. I had my hand at hunting with some family in Idaho for the first time years back when we were attacked by these giant hairy ape things that threw rocks at us. I had never been to an area that we went before and were hoping to possibly out hunt each other. I went into a deeper area of the woods than my cousins did and that's when we started to notice things around us changing. First, it was what I can describe as markers. I'm talking about uprooted trees, bent, 
twisted and curved in arches or just ripped off in the middle in certain spots. We really weren't sure what to make of it, but then the feeling of the woods itself had changed. It went from peaceful to dreadful. That was all before we started to notice a weird thudding sound, following rocks being tossed and thrown in our direction. Before thinking there were other hunters in the area, trying to play cruel tricks on us and boot us out as we were descended upon by these large, hairy ape creatures from the trees. Look, I know we've all heard of Bigfoot before, but something in my gut tells me that Bigfoot doesn't have wings and tries to swoop down at you. I've heard stories from other hunters in the town that I grew up in with encounters of large, upright walking apes or hairy beings that lived deep in the thicket. I never really believed in them, but to have an experience like this is something else. Were these Bigfoot that we encountered? They had large black wings, and their faces kind of resembled that of Alf. A short snout, ugly mother effers, sunken in black eyes, covered from head to toe in long black hair. Needless to say, we retreated from the area as these creatures pelted us with small rocks. And before you respond back to this email, asking me a million questions, I'll answer it all quickly for you. I don't know. I don't know why they were there, what they were, and were they Bigfoot? I have no answers. We didn't ask. We retreated and left it as just that, that we must have accidentally invaded some unknown animal's territory. I feel like that's really the only way to sum it all up, because if I spent too much time dwelling on it and all the what-ifs, I would go crazy. I wanted to send you this because you might know what it is that we ran into in that neck of the woods. You seem to be knowledgeable and an expert on all these monsters and whatnot. 